<laughs> All righty. Once again, welcome everybody. I'm so excited to share, um, you know, what God has for us and, and his heart for us. And I love how he is constantly bringing us back to things sometimes that, you know, we might think we know <laughs> and, uh, and giving us a further uh, even peek into that and how we can we can apply his word to our life. And so today, this is one of the things we're going to talk about on, on his mind and things we've been, he and I have been conversating about is, um, is how he desires for you to be skillful in his word to be skillful in his word, which is more than being able to quote scripture, right? It's more than just kind of knowing or thinking that a certain idea is in his word, but God, he showed me um, kind of a, a, a man standing with a bow and arrow, uh, you know, fully, I don't know what you call it, I guess cocked, so to speak, I'm not sure, but you know, his, his, his arrow fully drawn and he, and, and God is like, I want you to be so precise to be able to be so precise with my word that you never miss your target. And um, it is, it's often that um, I hear, you know, I, I was telling some people <laughs> the other day how my sisters uh, mess with me a lot, you know, every time they, or somebody has something going on in their life, uh, they say, my favorite line is I have a scripture for that, <laughs> right? It's like, so I'm always, no matter what is going on in somebody's life, I'm, I'm always bringing a scripture for them to hang on to. And that's because the thing that I have learned is that the only thing that is for sure, and the only thing that creates permanent change is God's word. And so we can try every other thing. And if you want temporary results, go ahead. But if you want to see something powerful move, if you want to be able to see something permanent in your life, then we got to use his word to do that. And so God is, he was bringing to mind some of these, you know, things that we hear people say often where they are contrasting what we have to do physically versus what we do spiritually. And it's almost as though the spiritual side comes on the butt. You know, like we say, we've got to pray, but we've got to, you know, seek the Lord, but we, and, and so what, anytime you use, but in the sentence, okay, whatever follows that is the lesser. Okay. It's the lesser. It's not the most important piece. And so the, the thing that God wants us to know is that it, it was almost as I pray that I can really get this across like you saying, but, um, is that he wants us to know his word works. There's no doubt there. But what we have to do is understand how to work his word. Okay. And that's what we're going to talk about today is working that word. Um, and I'm going to reference some things that uh, some, some of our previous recordings and I'll, we'll, we'll put that, um, that information back in a, in a play, the playlist for it as well, because this is really what he's bringing us back to. It is going to be critical as we move forward in life in any direction that you understand how to watch God's word come to its fullness. You see, because there are going to be, there are times in which other systems fail. People fail. What you think you can rely on won't be able to be relied on. And so God wants us to know, though, you have a higher system, a higher way and process of getting things done in your life by his word. But if we don't have the reliance upon it, you know, I, someone had said um, to me the other day, it, you know, they were, I guess, struggling with this whole concept of putting uh, the word to their circumstance. And, and they were like, you know, don't you feel like that's, it's kind of passive to say things like let go and let God, isn't that being passive? How in the world is it being passive? <laughs> it's almost like they're, they're dismissive of the power of the word because, but only because we've never fully understood how to work it and how to hang on long enough and watch it do its work. We abandon the word too quickly is what God is saying. We abandon the word too quickly. So today we're going to, um, uh, we're going to go through a few scriptures that talk about how the movement of the word, um, plays out in our life and the different levels in which we can watch his word move into manifestation. But the first thing I want to bring out is Matthew 11, and that's 28 through 30 in the message translation. 
And for those of you guys that are joining us the first time, um, we use different translations often because I think it's good to be able to read something that really makes sense to you. We're going to find um, the wording that clicks, that helps bring some understanding. And, um, and so we use different translations. So this is in the message translation. This is Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And it says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. What a beautiful invitation that God has for us to say that, listen, if you will intertwine with me, if you'll watch how I do it, things will be done so efficiently in your life in which nothing is a burden to you. I don't ask you to do anything that's hard. I don't ask you to do anything that is that is a burden or that cannot be done. And he is saying to us, he said, get away with me. Are you burned out? And so here's what I would I would say to you. If there's any area in your life in which you feel burnt out, it's not just on religion, like this scripture says, but what are the areas in which you're feeling drained? Is it business? Is there relationships? What are the areas that you are feeling like um, there is pain there that you're tired of carrying, that you're tired of walking with? God is saying you don't have to. You don't have to. My word, my presence can turn that all around. But here again, this sounds like a great t-shirt, <laughs> right? This is, this is part of what happens is we get so, we get, we, we don't understand the power behind what he just invited you to because we don't take it seriously enough because when we back that further, we have tried it. But see, God is trying to give us the instructions now. I don't want you to just try it. I want you to do it. <laughs> Right. I want you to do it. And so because of these um, these things that, again, they sound great on some T-shirts, but have not ever. We've never really walked in the full power of his word. Um, so skillful use is what we're talking about. How do we become skillful in his word? How do we um, this is the work of faith. OK, this is the work of faith. Faith takes work. Growing your faith, maturing your faith takes work. God gates, so the Bible says that all of us have given, been given a measure of faith. But in order to grow that, there is work involved. And I honestly, you know, believe when when he, he says in Hebrews about faith without works, you know, there's one level of that scripture that's talking about acting upon what you believe. But continue to take that further, that faith, unless you are working on it, does not bring results and his word always has results so that's how we can check whether we're using his word or not because faith his word is never stagnant his word is never stagnant so um let's look at a at an example of what i'm talking about here um if y'all remember the story of the the little boy who was possessed and the disciples um, were trying to cast this demon out of this little boy and they couldn't and this is in mark uh, yes mark 9 28 through 29 in the passion translation um and and of uh, Again, for those of you guys who are new, they are put in the scriptures in the chat in case you need to re-reference uh, those. So Mark 9, 28 through 29. So this boy is possessed, okay? And the disciples, they've been hanging out. They have been healing people, okay? They've been doing what they do and they get to this boy and he they could not cast the demon out. And so it says here that afterwards, when Jesus arrived at the house, the disciples asked him in private, why couldn't we cast out the demon? 
He answered them, this type of powerful spirit can only be cast out by fasting and praying. What is he really saying here? There is a level of flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit that has to go beyond your routine. Okay. It wasn't that the disciples didn't have the power flowing through them. They did. But you see what happens with us is we get so used to being in the pocket with his word on certain things. We get so used to quoting certain scriptures and being in church on a certain day. And we get used to be to operating in a level of power. And what Jesus is saying here is that you're the, 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 the average thing that you were doing to get results, you got to come higher than that. You got to come higher. You see, there is a level of being able to operate in his power that goes beyond your routine. And so if this is demonstrating to us, if we feel, if we have not gotten results from the word that we are standing on, that his promise has said to us, then we got to step above this routine of, let me just read this scripture today. Let me go into the, the you know, to Bible study today, whatever it is you're normally doing. He's saying, look, you got to go beyond that. There's a higher level of relationship here. And so the word moves. The word has movement. The Bible says that the word is alive. That means it cannot be stagnant. It is, and it is not just one thing. It is evolving. The word is meant to become flesh. Okay, where do we see that? Um, I, I always hear one thing, you know, a lot of folks that talk to me, um, I say all the time is that your words are supposed to come back with clothes on them. <laughs> your words should come back with clothes on them. And so we see that in John, I'm in John 1, 1 through 5, and then I'm going to drop down to 14. Now, um, I'm going to read it first, and then I'll tell you uh, a little bit more about it. And this, I'm in the Amplified for this one. John 1, 1 through 5, and then 14 in the Amplified. And it says, in the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. He was continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. All things were made and came into existence through him, and without him, not even one thing was made that has come into being. In him was life and the power to bestow life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it or overpower it for, or appropriate it or absorb it, and it is unreceptive to it. And the word, or Christ, became flesh this is down to 14, and lived among us. And we actually saw his glory, glory as belongs to the one and only begotten son of the father, the son who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, who is full of grace and truth, absolutely free of deception. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've read that scripture many times. And one time I read it, the Lord says, put your name in it. And I was like, what? Wait, hold on a second, because this is talking about Jesus here. I can't put my name in the scripture that's specifically about Jesus. And he said, this is the formula of manifestation. Understand that this is the word becoming flesh. And so he began to share with me, if you look at these are the conditions that are being met when manifestation comes. So when you put your word yourself in there and says that the word or Don was with God, was continually existing with God, does that not sound like the Holy Spirit in you? You exist with him. And so this, this, this environment, that's environment number one necessary is you and the word becoming one. You and the word becoming one. I am not outside of the word. The word is not outside of me. That that first has to exist. And he says that not anything in your life is made outside of what you create from what's, in, what's within you. And, the, and it says, then the word became flesh. What is inside of me becomes manifested here on the earth. 
so th there was he God shared with me basically five movements or five um, five levels of of how the word comes and starts off from um, from being in your eye, line of sight in 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 word form of the Bible to becoming something that gets pulled down out of the spiritual realm into this physical realm from being something that you have spoken to being something that you hold in your hand. God is concerned that you see results from, from what you believe because Amen. you are the demonstrator of the power of his word. You are who he relies on to watch this word manifest here on the earth. We just read here how it says the light, the light was a light for men. That's you. The word is designed to shine through you. And it is important to him that you know how to, again, skillfully execute that word. So there's five um, different stages we're going to, to touch on. And, and I'm, we don't have enough time to get into all of the, you know, get into depth with all of them, but we have recorded. I, I actually took a couple of weeks to go through each one of these separately. There is a playlist on our on our YouTube channel um, called Illumination to Manifestation. So um, before we get off of here, we'll I'll drop the the link to that in the chat, or if someone else can find it, so that you can absorb more because there's so much more than what we'll be able to to hit today but I wanted to give you um, God wants to kind of give a pre a preview I guess um, so there's five stages one of those the first one is illumination okay illumination the second one we're going to talk about is meditation it's all the Asians <laughs> All right. The third one we're going to talk about is revelation. All right. And then we're going to talk about legislation. And then lastly is manifestation. You see, without fully being able to kind of understand how that word moves, God says we will abort his word too quickly. And therefore we don't see the results that we're looking for. And that has become the routine. It's almost as though if we don't get microwave results, we're not willing to cook it in the oven anymore. <laughs> right? We want, we want to have it right now. We want to have it right now. And, and his word is not something to be rushed, although it will act as swiftly as you move through these stages. So illumination is the first one. And, and this is for you to be able to recognize the differences between, because I'm using these words, uh, we, we traditionally hear them in church a lot, but maybe you've never thought about how to break those down or understand the differences between them. Um, so you can identify what stage you're in. Number one, illumination. This is when the Holy Spirit turns the light on. It's like all of a sudden you're in a, in a dark room and the light gets turned on. Illumination is when the Holy Spirit first turns that light on. That means that I look at a scripture and I read it and I can cognitively understand it. Okay. I can cognitively understand it, but illumination brings another level to me just understanding the words I'm reading. What illumination does is says, now the Holy Spirit is beginning to say, wait a minute, there might be something here that applies to you. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> it might not just be that this is a good memory verse. <laughs> okay, <laughs> It might not just be that this is the, just the good reading for the day. Illumination is when you can, you can, you can see now begin to see that, wait a minute, something in you just starts to stir and you can feel the wheels in your brain turning. Y'all ever felt that? Like you just, you feel your brain, you know, your brain is thinking, <laughs> right? You know, it's like, you can see the steam start to sometimes, and, and you got to look out for this. 
some of this illumination may run contrary to something you have heard in maybe tradition, okay? You got to look out for that because unfortunately, just like his word has said, your tradition has made my word of no effect. That's what Jesus said. Your tradition has made my word of no effect, meaning that you're so stuck in your ways of how you want to do things that my word doesn't have any room. So elimination, you must be open to hearing something that may be contrary. Now, it's not going to be contrary to his word, okay? It's not going to be contrary to his word, but it may be contrary to tradition, to religion, to denomination, okay? <laughs> All right. Yep. I said, I said it. Okay. <laughs> right? It may be contrary. So you got you to look out for that, okay? And he, you, you've got to make room, allow the Holy Spirit to speak, okay? Psalms 119 and 105 in the New Living Translation, <clears throat> Psalms 19, 105 in the New Living, it says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. You see, if we if we kind of back that out and we think about, man, how many situations am I in? How many circumstances are going on in my life in which I need more understanding? I need more revelation. Things have happened. I don't know why, or this isn't happening. I don't understand why, or this did happen. You know, the, it says that his word is a lamp to guide my feet. It is a light for my path. So we can always go back to his word is the ultimate illuminator. His word is the one thing, the constant thing that will bring light into the situation. Let's look at, and, and let me tell you, let me give you an example of how we do this. Now we're, I'm in Psalms 118, oh, excuse me, 119. I'm dropping, going a little bit above from where we just were to 89 through 93. So Psalms 119, 89 through 93, still in new living. Okay, it says, your eternal word, O Lord, stands firm in heaven. Your faithfulness extends to every generation as enduring as the earth you created. Your regulations remain true to this day, for everything serves your plans. If your instructions hadn't sustained me with joy, I would have died in my misery. I will never forget your commandments, for by them you give me life. Now, you can read through this, and it's a very comforting passage. It's a very, you know, it's beautifully written, but illumination says, I don't just, I understand these words. But illumination begins to say, wait a minute, there is a truth here that he's trying to get to you. Number one, his word is eternal, stands firm in heaven. Your faithfulness extends to every generation. You see, that now becomes a truth. I can illuminate with this. Think about this. If you're having some issue with your kid, okay, that's a generation. This word just said his faithfulness extends to every generation as enduring as the earth he created. His faithfulness extends to my children and it will endure as long as this earth beyond the earth. But this is not just me reading the scripture. This is now illumination. You see, so what's going to happen is you're reading his word and all of a sudden he's going to bring something to mind. Bring a situation to mind. Now I want you to go back and look at that and say, okay, what, what did he actually just say? Let's pick this apart. Well, he just gave me a promise. He just gave me a promise about my kid and we were having difficulty, right? He just gave me a promise that his word is eternal. This is how illumination begins. Illumination is designed to help us understand that there is a truth which is higher than the facts I'm dealing with. Truth is higher than facts. 
truth will be his truth will beat facts every time. And that it's not just, it doesn't happen just one time or in one area. You see, you'll come back to this scripture and a whole nother something is going on and this scripture is going to say something totally different. In our calls during the day, there are many times I'll use a particular scripture on 15 different subjects and it's the same verse <laughs> because it constantly gives, it's alive. Okay. So, you know, I, I want to say, tell you this, that the Holy Spirit had to, I had to take them, take a moment to learn how to hear him. And so I'm going to take a quick detour into that for a minute, because I often hear um, people talking about how they're not sure if they're here, God. And I remember being in that same space. I remember specifically learning how he spoke to me. And it's going to look a little different for most everybody, but here's something that is critical for you to decide in your mind. You got to decide that you hear him. You got to let that, you got to settle that fact that he's talking to you. That is the number one barrier that stops the voice of God for us is that we aren't, we're not sure it's him. And I understand if you feel like you've never heard him and you're not quite sure how, it, that's what we're going to talk about for just a second here, because we don't know enough, not experienced enough to be able to rely. But what I'm telling you right here is this is a confirming word for you from God that you can hear his voice. Let's look at, let's look first at that example, um, Jeremiah 1 and 5, and this is in the message. Jeremiah 1 and 5. See, what we're not going to do is let the enemy sit us and keep us in confusion. We're not going to let him play that game. And so Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Well, how did he know you if you didn't exist? He said, before I shaped you, before I knit you together in your mother's womb, I knew you. It says, before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. He had already picked you out before you ever got formed. That means he knew you, which means you existed. Okay. It says, the end of that scripture says, a prophet to the nations. That's what I had in mind for you. See, this was something that totally blew me away when, when the Holy Spirit first said to me, this is what God said. I was in prayer one day. I was in my closet. I'm reading his word and, you know, just, just fellowshipping. And, the, and then I heard him say, um, you know, my verse, you know, my voice because you heard it before. And I was like, huh? <laughs> he said, you heard it in the garden. You were with me in the garden. And I, that was something I have never heard that in any Bible study I ever been in. He said, you were with me in the garden. You've heard my voice. And I'm going to give you a reference for that. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 in the message. It was one of the most beautiful things I have ever heard him say, because it meant that in, in, in God's, God's love for us, he's always had us with him, always had us with him, always desired that we would be in, a, in Eden. That's where he wanted us all, not just Adam and Eve. It says, <clears throat> Genesis 1, 26 through 28, in the message, it says, God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature so that they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them. Prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. We'll see, you know, you can, you read this word 
um, in any version, and it says, let us make man. Well, the word there is actually mankind. Adam is actually mankind. It's not just the name. So the Bible says that God made mankind. Y'all know your spirits, right? Your spirit first. Now that's a whole nother teaching, okay? But we, but when he created us, he said made in his image. Well, his image was not the body, the spirit. The spirit was his image. So he created mankind, a spirit. And that you were there. And so he said to me, you were there. You he you've heard my voice. Okay. Um, so you can, you can rely on the fact that you know his voice. Let's look at a, another one. Um, John 10, 14 through 15 in the message translation. John 10, 14 through 18. Did I say 16? 14 through 18. It says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and my own sheep know me. I know my own sheep and my own sheep know me. So one thing I want you to do is as if the enemy is trying to tell you, you don't know how to hear him, then this is a scripture you can come back to and combat that. He is a good shepherd. He knows me and I know him. It says in the same way, the father knows me and I know the father. I put the sheep before myself, sacrificing myself if necessary. You need to know that I have other sheep in addition to those in this pen. I need to gather and bring them too. They'll also recognize my voice. So he's saying he was, he was speaking of the Jews, the Gentiles, the people he was going to go get. He said, doesn't matter because they will know my voice too. You will know his voice. It says, then it will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the father loves me because I freely lay down my life. And so I am free to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own free will. I have the right to lay it down. I also have the right to take it up again. I receive this authority personally from my father. You see, so this is illumination time. What this is saying is that I know his voice. I do know his voice. I'll be able to recognize it. You can practice hearing his voice, okay? You can practice understanding and distinguishing if he is talking or not. You see, when we've been so used to, um, you know, relying on our senses, our emotions, our feelings to discern how we want to move, God is saying, I want you to come up higher and learn how to distinguish my voice so that you move according to the spirit, and the way, one of the ways that you can distinguish it's because it's all thought. His voice comes in the form of a thought. And sometimes that voice is you pick up and you're reading the scripture and it speaks to something. All of a sudden, this thought of your circumstance, what we were just talking about, that happens. Sometimes there is a thought that runs across your mind right before you finish the sentence <laughs> or ask a question. Sometimes it is in someone else saying a confirming word to you. There's many ways in which he reveals himself in which he speaks and ask the Holy Spirit because he'll start out with you very gently. <laughs> okay. But the first thing you have to be able to pull out of this is that you do know his voice. So, so don't ever allow yourself to say that you don't anymore. That is a lie. We just took the truth out of his word right here. He said his sheep know his voice. We heard his voice before. You can recognize his voice because it's going to sound like love. It's going to sound like wisdom. It's going to be patient, right? We know all the things that love is. Love is large. Love is patient. Love doesn't quit. I can tell if that thought is based on something like that or is based on revenge or is based on anger, is based on envy or frustration or is doubt or is pain talking. You can distinguish those that that lets you know whose voice it is. So but you can practice that you can practice that. Um it becomes, there's a, there's a feeling, you know, sometimes it's just something you just know, something, you know, 
this this inner strong knowing. Um, so there's a lot of ways that God can begin to to speak. So I, I just want to we took that little detour real quick because that's something that has to be settled for you is that you can hear him because otherwise you won't be able to walk through the rest of these stages of his word when you're constantly questioning is it him or is it not right um and again we've got we've got more on that so the second thing is meditation so we come from illumination to get in this glimpse that wait a minute this might actually apply this might be something that um, I can learn from. This, this might be something for me. That's illumination. Meditation, this is the tough spot for most, most of us, especially when our brains run a mile a minute. <laughs> okay. Because meditation is probably the part that takes the most time, I think. It's the one in which we spend the most time having to... Um, meditation is the sinking in of that word. You see, when we think about what the world's view of say meditation is, and you know, a, a lot of it is surrounded around emptying out of self. Okay. It's diverse, di just, just taking everything out of me and, and emptying. But the Bible says meditation is actually filling up the biblical meditation is filling myself up to where I overflow with his word. Meditation is the process of that seed getting into the soil of the heart in a spot in which it will not be moved. And there's, there's, there's a, a, a stages even inside of meditation. Okay, um, let's let's look at Romans 12 and 2 in the New Living. Romans 12 and 2. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, meditation is where I do things like um, I read his word and then I break down word by word. I, I look at each piece of it and begin to ask the Holy Spirit, what of this applies to me? You, you'll begin to, to then you want to come to a time not only where you're going through these, these different um I guess asking these questions, you want to ask what truth, Holy Spirit, do I need to pull from this? What is a fact? How is this moving in my life? What, what do I believe now? Ask yourself these questions. What do I believe now? And not just what do I say I believe, but what do my actions say I believe? Which is different. You know, I, sometimes it sounds, we want to, you know, look good for other people and say that we believe his word, but Lord, what am I actually believing based on, well, you know, am I having so much fear in this area that I refuse to make a move towards what you called me to do? Okay. Well, we got to deal with that. So you want to take his word. You want to take the confirming words he's giving. You want to take some of those things and begin to ask questions. But then the important thing is after you ask the questions to sit down and listen for the answer. Okay. <laughs> and this can be one of the really tough spots is to get quiet, get quiet in your mind. Um, you have to be able to allow while your mind is cognitively taking in this information, your spirit needs to settle and absorb the word. Your spirit, your soul needs to settle and absorb. And that is what that's what what we're talking about just in Romans is let his word transform the way you think. See, we often kind of get that backwards. We try to fit God 
and these words that we're reading into my normal thought process. I'm trying to understand it from the things I've experienced and the stuff I've heard and read when it's actually the opposite. I'm supposed to get rid of the way I normally think about it and let his word give me the way to think about it. That's how you know you're in that process because all of a sudden your first thought, your first inkling about a certain situation changes to be in alignment with what you've already always experienced to now, well, this is what his word says. I got to go back to this word. You know, just like we just talked about the example of your children and how his promises are for generations, his faithfulness to them are for generations. When I find myself worried about them, that is my soul still trying to understand, here's what I'm seeing happen, but your word says something contrary. Now, do I stop my thought process and say, no, his word said, or do I let myself continue down worrying about what's going on with the kid? You see, that's the difference. Meditation is the process of me continually to take in that word, continually to absorb that word until this time the anxiety tries to rise up, but I drop it back down because the word said, I combat it with the word said. Now my brain, my spirit begins to come forward. My spirit begins to rise because that's the word my spirit's been given. Now I can push down and tell my soul how to feel. And what we're not going to do is sit up here and get anxious and worried. What we're going to do is go back and speak his word. That is the bringing ourselves into alignment. And see, by reviewing his word, by rehearsing his presence, um, and, and, and here's a tip around that, because I was often, when I first kind of started to really sit down and make myself have to listen and hear him, I would, um, I had to, in my mind, go into a space in which I couldn't hear anything. I had to put earphones on. I could not, I didn't want to hear the kids. I didn't want to hear anything going on around me. And I had to visually create a, set, a space to go in my mind. And for me, it was this totally blank, like kind of wheat field type place. It was just me and God there. And so I knew when I went there, that was just he and I, and I had to quiet, I had to practice quieting my mind and sitting still. And so it may take time, but don't give up on that. Keep rehearsing that because in that presence, in that place in which you are still, your spirit can begin to get information about this meditative process and what to do uh, further. And so um, he here's one thing that I, that I know. This meditation allows you to get to know God in a way. You know, by knowing his word, you can also distinguish his voice. You know, here's the funny thing about, about it. Think about this. You know, there's some of y'all that know me pretty well. You know, if somebody said, I saw Jacinta in Walmart and she was cussing out the checkout lady. <laughs> now, how many of y'all would believe that? <laughs> you better not believe that. <laughs> right. But you wouldn't believe that because why? Because you know me and you know my nature, Right. You know my nature. And that is what meditation does. You'll get to know God's nature by reading his, his word, by sitting in his presence. You're going to get to know his nature and you'll be able to pick out what he's saying, right? So um, one other thing that revelation is, is not just absorbing his word, but it is also the practice of releasing what does not belong. You see, through the meditative process, um, you will, he will begin to identify feelings, you know, emotions, thought processes that also I need to be able to lay down at his feet and not carry with me, right? And so that is a big part. This meditation is a big chunk of his words, movement, okay? What happens after meditation is now revelation. Revelation. 
And revelation is now I can see this picture. So now meditation has created such a picture that I begin to be able to see very clearly the picture God is painting. And what I mean by that is, again, let's take the example of the child. Well, the anxiety and frustration was welling up because I wasn't, um, you know, I was worried about some behavior that they have. Revelation now begins to allow me to paint the picture of my child being faithful to God's word, of my child being through that situation. See, that all of a sudden a new picture begins to form rather than the one the enemy would want me to see. So revelation, now when I see that picture, my brain now starts to own it. You know you've gotten to the revelation stage when nobody can tell you anything different. Okay, nobody can take that from you. You are going to see your situation now from a totally different perspective. Your perception is going to change. The way you see what's going on is going to be totally different because revelation has come in. Now that is mine. That belongs to me. And you're not taking that from me. And there is no difference. I don't care what you got to say. No, we, we ain't. I'm not going to accept anything less. I will not expect or accept anything different. That's when revelations kicked in. You know, Matthew 4 and 4 <clears throat> in the Passion Translation says, he answered this, uh, let's see, did I say Matthew 4 and 4 in the Passion? It says, he answered, the scriptures say, bread alone will not satisfy, but true life is found in every word that constantly goes forth from God's mouth. You see, this, this verse says man does not live by bread alone. You probably are familiar with it that way, but by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. Well, this word is a revelatory word. It's what's called a rhema word, which is different from just the written word. It is the word in which it says God proceeds out of his mouth. That is a right now I'm speaking and he's always speaking. And so he, this, this word here is saying, I don't live by how much word I can quote. I live by what he is saying to me at all times. And that is a relationship. And that is revelation. I can hold on to, I know it belongs to me. He has spoken, he has painted this picture and, and, and this is mine. And let me give you a difference of this so you can have a reference to understand the difference between when I own the word and when I don't. Okay. Because again, it's very important for us to know where we're at, not from a place of condemnation, but so you can get to where you're going because you got to know where you're at. And so this is debt is a great example of this. When Deuteronomy says, you're going to be the lender and not the borrower, you're going to be the lender and not the borrower. And we love to shout about that when we get to church. But when the new credit, when, when somebody is, is, uh, sends me a credit card uh, application or they send me this new thing or that new thing, or, you know, here, let me go buy myself a new car. The first thing we're doing is looking to get into debt. <laughs> well, again, I'm not saying that out of condemnation. That's, that's you and your budget. But doggone it, if you believe you're supposed to be the, the lender and not the borrower, then at some point you're going to stop trying to become a borrower. That's the difference. I can know the word, but it's not a revelation for me. Meaning me being only a lender and not a borrower has not become real to me. Okay, and that's okay because God has created a mechanism for us to get there. But I'm just saying, know where you're at. And that's how you can tell the difference. Okay. Um, whew, last two. We get in there. A couple minutes. <laughs> okay. Legislation. Okay. Legislation is now when I have a revelatory word, that means I take no, nothing else for, uh, I'm not going to take anything else as a substitution. 
I'm not taking any counterfeits of what this word says. Now I can legislate with that word. Legislation means I am using his word to now establish what was created in the heavens here on earth. This is about your authority to wield that word like the sword that it is. Be, but you see, that's why it's part of a process because I have seen, and I did it myself many times where I'd be desperate in a situation and I'd go look for a scripture and somebody gives me this scripture and I say this scripture and doggone it, nothing happened. Well, I hadn't even taken the time to see, to, to allow myself to actually believe it. So it's like wielding a fake sword. And that's how we get into this, this rhythm of not seeing word come to manifestation because we haven't allowed what need to happen up until legislation, which is the illumination, the manifestation, the revelation. We have not allowed the process. So legislation says now I can step back and use that to speak to the situation. Now, or, or I may need to, uh, there's many ways in which this will play out. The Holy Spirit is going to lead you on how. Sometimes you're going to have to get rid of some things. Sometimes there are going to be, the enemy has sent some assignments to try to sit on, he sent some giants to try to sit on your land. There are going to be times in which your legislation is to remove what doesn't belong there. You have to be able to see that though. There's going to be times where your legislation is planting a seed. Now you speak. You see, there are things in which God has, he'll reveal something to me in the scripture, something around, you know, a goal, something that I have that I want to see, but I will not speak a word about it. I won't speak anything on that scripture out loud until it is in here, until I have that revelation. Because I don't want to play around with it. I don't want my mind to start getting into this place where, oh, you're saying something you don't believe. Because that's an endless loop we find ourselves in and we don't see anything working. That is called double mindedness. And the Bible says that when you have double mindedness, don't expect to see any results. So I'm very careful when he has given me a picture that's bigger than what I can handle at the moment. I'm going to study. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to wait until something right until that picture is so clear to me that that belongs to me. Now, when I speak that word, oh, now it's going down. <laughs> now it's going down. Now the seed has been planted and that seed ain't going anywhere. And I won't be over there uprooting it with doubt, peeking in on it, trying to see what it's doing. You see, um, this is, this is authority that you can legis use your, with this legis legislation, Matthew 18 and 18 and the Amplified. Okay. Matthew 18 and 18. It says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whatever you bind, forbid, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, permanent, uh, uh, permit, declare lawful on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. You see, if you notice, it says shall have. This is not about you making up new laws. OK, this is not about you making up new laws and new things. This is you've been granted per permission to see what is in the kingdom realm, to see what is in the spiritual realm and use it to legislate. So he's saying it was already up there. I was just waiting for you to get it. So now you can bring it here on earth. And that's your power. That's authority. That's the word you can legislate with. The word that I see. The word that I see. There's power there. Man, last scripture. Okay, I think. Not quite. Y'all hang with me for a few more minutes. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Uh, Mark 4, 
26 through 29 in the Passion Translation. Mark 4, 26 through 29. You see, oftentimes, because we haven't been through these other processes before, we can tend to think, if I'm not seeing anything, that's delay. When really what it is, if you're seeing properly, if you have been through these, these other stages, then you know it's really just the seed taking root. You see, when you think about, um, think about pregnancy, okay? okay. Uh, the, the body knows before the woman even knows she's pregnant. It starts doing all kind of funky things, okay? <laughs> and all of a sudden, the woman is like, something ain't right, <laughs> okay? <laughs> something is off, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then we start to have all the, but from the moment that woman conceives, you don't see anything. You don't feel anything. You don't know. A woman, it'll be sometimes 11, 12 weeks before she ever knows anything is going on. So could you, but was she not pregnant all that time? Yes. Yes. See, that, that word starts in the invisible first. It starts in a place that cannot be seen. And this is what Mark 4, 26 through 29 is telling us. It says, Jesus also told them this parable. God's kingdom realm is like someone spreading seed on the ground. He goes to bed and gets up day after day and the seed sprouts and grows tall, though he knows not how. All by itself it sprouts and the soil produces a crop. First the green stem and then the head on the stalk and then the fully developed grain in the head. Then when the grain is ripe, he immediately puts in the sickle to the grain because harvest time has come. So he says, my word is just like that, planted in the ground. You might not see anything right now, but that's you in meditation time. That's you in illumination time. That's you painting this picture of revelation. And then all of a sudden revelation takes, takes root. And then we see the, the green stem. Man, it is, it is a movement. There are stages and thank God for the stages. We don't want to skip any part of this process. You don't want to skip any part of this process because ultimately what drives all of this is the fact that there is a relationship being built. You are learning to hear the voice of your father. You are learning how to trust him. You are learning his nature. You are learning the mysteries of, his, of, of the supernatural, that all of that is actually also an outpouring of wielding his word. So we don't want to skip any of this. He, he gave me this picture, and this is the, this is the last scripture for real, <laughs> okay? He gave me his, th this picture of this kind of going back and forth, um, you know, go, or not going back and forth, but the consistency of going into his word, meditating his word until we see the manifestation. And this is a, a, another familiar passage, but let's look at 2 Kings 5, 10 through 15 in the message translation. 2 Kings 5, 10 through 15 in the message. It says, Elisha sent out a servant to meet him with this message. So we, this is the, I'm picking up where uh, Naaman actually had a skin disease and he got sent over um, to basically go see Elisha to, um, to take care of this. And so Elijah sends a servant out to meet him. And he says, go to the river Jordan and immerse yourself seven times. Your skin will be healed and you'll be as good as new. Naaman lost his temper. He spun around saying, I thought I'd, I thought he'd personally come out and meet me, call on the name of God, wave his hand over the disease spot and get rid of the disease. The Damascus rivers, Abana and Farpar are cleaner by far than any of the rivers in Israel, why not bathe in them? I'd at least get clean. He stomped off and said, mad as a hornet. Now see, here's, here's, here's kind of the picture of what we do. We got a situation, we go pray, we go ask God about it. And he's like, 
okay, here's my word on the situation. And we like, wait a minute, but I thought you were about to part the Red Sea. And I thought you were about to go, you got to go strike them down because they've been messing with me. And you about to, we, we getting all thinking God's supposed to do this and that. And we're expecting some. And he says, no, <laughs> no, we're not doing any of that. What happened? It says, but his servants caught up with him and said, father, if the prophet had asked you to do something hard and heroic, wouldn't you have done it? See, goes right back up to what we just read at the beginning passage in Matthew. My burden is easy. I won't put anything ill-fitting on you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything hard. But it's sometimes we expect something to be more difficult than what it is in just watching his word come to pass and just cooperating with his word. We want something harder. We want to jump through hoops. And so he said, if, wouldn't you have done it? So why not the simple wash and be clean? Why not? If he told you to just go read this word, y'all, <laughs> I've been in so many things before where, where I'm like, Lord, this needs to get done. That needs to get done. And I need this client to close and I need this. And, and he says, just sit right here and read this scripture. But, but, but just sit right here and read the scripture. And what happens? Phone starts ringing. <laughs> and every time I call, nobody wants to answer. <laughs> right? right? It's like, just go do the simple thing. And it says, so he did it. He went down and immersed himself in the Jordan seven times, following the orders of the holy man. His skin was healed. You see, this is, this is that meditative period that time you go down one time and it didn't quite look the situation didn't seem like it had changed the person didn't change their mind this this and this and then you go down another time and you come back you go back to that word another time and you come back up and you go back to that word another time and you come back up and it says seven times seven times that's the completion number that's the number that it's done. He says, you keep coming back. You keep going down. You keep immersing yourself in that word. And what happened after the seventh time, it says he was healed. There was manifestation to the word he had gone there for. Right? So, amen, y'all. Amen. Love his word. And I love him for teaching us how to be patient and watch his word work, but giving us the practical ways in which we can follow and identify where we are so that we don't abort what he has for our life. We don't let go of the scripture. This is what standing on his word is. This is the act of standing on the word is allowing all these stages to happen and you will see flesh your words will have clothes on them that is his promise okay amen hope that helps somebody today <laughs> amen amen, amen. all righty um let me